To start us off, I want to share Carrie's definition of sustainable nutrition. As a global leader in science-backed sustainable nutrition, Carrie defines it as the ability of food systems to provide sufficient energy and essential nutrients to maintain the good health of the popular of the population without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their nutritional needs. This approach emphasizes creating foods that support health while also considering the environmental and cultural context of food consumption. If you happen to do a Google search on sustainable nutrition, the results will likely offer a link to Carrie's Nutrition and Health Institute, which was established by Carrie to advance science for healthier food. And I'm including the link in the presentation slides. Before we get started on the regulations, did you know in the US that over one third of the food supply is never eaten, wasting the resources used to produce it and creating many environmental impacts, including breaking down and generating methane, a powerful greenhouse gas. The EPA states that food waste is the single most common material landfilled in the United States. Next slide. So globally, there's a focus on increasing recycling of food and other organic materials to support a more circular economy, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and building cleaner, healthier communities. We're going to take, we're going to walk through some of the regulations now, starting with uh, the U.S. This past June, the U.S. created a federal interagency collaboration to reduce food loss and waste, which includes the USDA, the EPA, the FDA, and the White House. The National Strategy for Reducing Food Loss and Waste and Recycling Organics is part of the Biden administration's whole of government approach to tackle climate change. The strategy will support policies that incentivize and encourage the prevention of food loss and waste and further supports the United States 2030 Food Loss and Waste Reduction Goal, which aims to reduce food loss and waste by 50% by the year 2030. With the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, uh, and, it's, and it's directly aligned with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs target 12.3. Next is a review of the European Union's Framework for Sustainable Food Systems, or FSFS, which is a key initiative under, under the European Union's Farm to Fork Strategy. This is aimed to be the overarching framework for all sustainable sustainability regulations and will integrate sustainability into all food related policies. This initiative is part of the broader European Green Deal, which seeks to make Europe the first climate neutral content by 2050. There are many initiatives in the EU happening separately that will be considered under FSFS, such as the EU's step to combat deforestation through its regulation of deforestation free products, which aims to ensure products consume do not contribute to deforestation worldwide. The regulation covers seven commodities, which are cattle, cocoa, coffee, palm oil, rubber, soy, and timber or wood. And as part of this regulation, products must not be produced on land that was deforested after December 31st of 2020. And the regulation will be fully enforced by December 30th of this year. Now onto green, the Green Claims Directive, which aims to harmonize B2B and B2C environmental claims around carbon footprint. The latest draft of the regulation includes validation methods, and they are hoping to finalize this directive by end of this year or early next year and there will be a two-year implementation period. Now I wanna highlight a significant piece of legislation aimed at enhancing and modernizing sustainability reporting requirements for companies within the European Union. This is the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive, or the CSRD, and it provides clear and consistent reporting guidelines, and it's not only for food companies. With this, companies must disclose detailed information on their ESG impacts, 
the directive is meant to ensure that investors and stakeholders have access to reliable and comparable sustainability information. The first set of companies subject to this new rule must start reporting next year for the 2024 fiscal year. There are plenty of other initiatives as well, including the Packaging and Plastic Waste Reduction Regulation, or PPWR, which focuses on food waste and reduction and recycling with a minimum target to achieve by 2030. Another is the Food Information to Consumers Labeling Regulation and may change the definition of used by and best before dates to prevent unnecessary food waste. Lastly, for the EU, there's also a food waste framework and this directive is in the works and in the infancy stage, so more to come on that in the future. Moving on to Mexico. On April 17th of this year, Mexico published a general law of adequate and sustainable food, which aims to achieve a healthy, fair, sustainable, and competitive agri-food system. This includes reducing environmental impacts with a focus on biodiversity and ecosystems to enable access to food for present and future generations, as well as preserving the use of traditional techniques and ancestral knowledge for food production. After publishing a law, the authority prepares the specific rules and guidelines in a document, which is currently under construction. So now on to nutrition initiatives. Global initiatives are being taken to accelerate efforts to empower consumers with information to make quick and informed purchase decisions and create healthier food supply. This aligns with the U.S.'s national strategy that came out of the White House conference in September of 2022. These global initiatives include front of pack labeling and warnings, sugar sweetened beverage taxes, marketing restrictions, and ingredient bans. Next slide, please. Global organizations and governments are responding with a focus on products high in sodium, high in fat, and high in sugar, and in some cases, calories. On this map, the blue shows mandatory labeling and green is currently voluntary. As we, at, as we know at CBA, the FDA has said they expect to provide like draft rulings for front of pack labeling schemes this fall, and Canada's front of pack warning symbol will be effective Jan 1 of 2026. When looking at this slide, Mexico and Latin America have been in the forefront of implementing mandatory labeling schemes. And to, right of, to the right of the screen, you'll see that Europe has a variety of voluntary front of pack schemes, included grading indicators like NutraScore and color coded such as traffic lights. And next slide, please. To emphasize the global perspective and provide a bit more context, I'm including a quick visual of what's going on in Southeast Asia related to sustainable nutrition policies. There are several countries that have sugar sweetened beverage taxes, marketing restrictions prohibiting advertising products high in fat, sugar, or salt to children, and also bans or limits on ingredients such as PHOs or trans fats, and of course, nutrition labeling initiatives to help consumers make informed purchase decisions. If you'd like more information um, on this slide, we can provide it after, after the presentation. So the regulations and nutrition policies that we just reviewed, reviewed will remain a global priority. And therefore it is imperative for companies to strategize product development and reformulation through the lens of sustainable nutrition and the important role of innovation. Industry really has an opportunity in all of these areas by helping to prove uh, nutrition profiles. For example, in the US where we're allowed to use uh, the upcoming flexibility to allow salt substitutes in standardized foods where sodium is either an optional or a required ingredient and also innovating with new ingredients or new technologies. Reducing food waste through solutions for shelf life extension and therefore feeding more people. Innova uh, we need to consider packing, packaging solutions as part of the in innovation process. And finally, we must communicate all of this to our consumers, both on pack and beyond. And now I'm gonna pass it over to Carrie's chief technical officer, 
Emer Robertson, who's going to walk us through the product innovation with a focus on sustainability. Thanks very much, Cheryl, and uh, great to be with everybody this afternoon. Uh, thank you for having us. And we're, this is an exciting topic that uh, we could spend a lot of time talking about. So hopefully we will have a lot of good questions in the chat box. Just a reminder to use that if you can. Um, so Cheryl, thank you for that overview. And I think our intent of talking about, uh, let's call it the regulatory dynamic and landscape at the start of the session was to really lay the foundation for you know what what we get to do about it and and um, how we innovate and how we progress together forward within the industry. So, if we move on to the next slide, Christina, please, just a little bit of a topic around what is innovation at Kerry. So, in the same way that Cheryl talked about how we think about sustainable nutrition, I'm just going to make a couple of comments around what what does innovation mean for us within our organization. So, Kerry, uh, we celebrated. Uh, we're in our in our fiftieth. In our 50s at this stage as an organization and really from the very early days in our organization as a company that was set up in the southwest of Ireland in the 1970s innovation has been part of the DNA of our organization and has very much been that that innovation really set the scene and has been an integral to the future of our organization over the last 10 years and we shared some of this information at um, a Cagney conference, an investor conference earlier this year. And we, in that conference, we really wanted to share a lot about the investments that we've made in science and technology through innovation. And, um, you know, when we looked back over the last 10 years, we've spent above $3 billion in science and our science and technology ecosystem. That has come in people. We have a really strong global team. We have over uh, 1,100 scientists globally. They're based in 70 technology and innovation centers. As a team, we've submitted over, um, we have over 1,200 patents. We have 350 plus clinical studies that we have done. Um, and we believe as well that external partnership is really important. So we have over 60 university and external partnerships. As an organization, we manufacture over 22 different core technologies. So the portfolio is quite broad. Um, and for us, we really try to prioritize. And prioritizing that innovation is around developing and discovering innovative solutions to deliver against the future needs of our marketplace and their future consumer needs. And as we we'll talk about over the course of this uh, webinar together, there are plenty of those um, to work with. So for us, we try to put innovation at the forefront of our decision making and thinking about how we link everything from market research and insights, how we enable that with process and digital technology, and how we run a global innovation program so that we can make sure that we are meeting the needs of consumers across the world. Of course, as you heard from Cheryl's presentation, uh, the impact and the influence of the regulatory landscape is monumental on these innov innovation priorities. And they provide both lots of challenges and opportunities and key decision points for us, uh, both in North America and uh, globally. So thinking about how we look at innovation and, and what it means for us, for at Kerry, it's about very much blending that science with culinary expertise and imagination. We have very much a for food, from food for food mentality. And so this graphic really demonstrates how we, the different lenses that we use to approach innovation. And for us, innovation is about nourishing food or nourishing people and driving food, tech, driving food um, and life across the globe. So for us, it's about focusing on innovating for today. So we have, if you look in the bottom left-hand corner, we've got a really significant application innovation program in our organization where existing capabilities and technologies that we have today, how can we find novel applications for them um, and new applications or applications that meet a new consumer need leveraging existing technologies. On the bottom right hand side, we try to focus on innovating for tomorrow. So that is where we're running very specific, longer term programs of work to create differentiated technologies and new technologies that we can really push across both food, beverage, meat and the pharma space. And so we have very specific, dedicated teams that work on innovation priorities um, that are, I suppose, quite distinct from the everyday uh, business that we have with our customers. And then I mentioned partnerships and really at the top um, of the graphic here is representing the work that we do around open innovation and collaboration with external partnerships. That really spans everything from academia, universities, startup organizations. We had a really interesting event in Europe several months ago where we had several new startup organizations come and spend 
some time with us so that we could collaborate around the technologies that, and the problems that they look are looking to solve and how can we partner together with them to either accelerate their impact or for them to help us accelerate our impact and really looking to work with um, both, our, of course, our customers and our suppliers as well to try and future proof and bring, you know, more more solutions through um, that innovation to our customers. And at the center of it, I mentioned, we are very much, our heritage at Kerry is a heritage of food and a heritage of natural products. Uh, we do not come from a sort of a chemical or a synthetic background. And so food craft, which is a term that we've spent some time defining, um, but it really is at the heart of innovation for us. And we actually have approximately 80 craft experts globally that are trained in everything from Michelin star restaurants to the world's greatest bars and um, coffee culture. So we have baristas and chefs and food craft experts across the globe. And those gastronomic capabilities, really, we try to keep in line and match our breadth of ingredients, technologies and scientific expertise. So we try to blend that science and culinary and then in terms of bringing this to our customers, of course, look, this is a, a little bit of a busy slide in some respects, and I'm not expecting everybody to, to read it, but what it, it it's trying to show is we are really trying to make sure that our innovation priorities and our technology portfolio represent the market dynamics that are there today. And I think we're all aware we, we work in a very dynamic, fast moving um, space, especially in the food and beverage industries uh, and categories, you know, there's challenges, everything from processing to regulatory pressure, nutritional optimization. And as consumers, we really demand pretty significant uh, sustainability impact. And we expect all of these things to come with zero compromise. So we're not interested in any trade-offs. Um, and I think as consumers, we really have significant expectations that we can meet these needs but we and we can meet our own specific need states, whether that's enhanced nutrition, or specific need states, all in a way that can be done that is better for, for us as a society and better for us, our planet. We know, and Cheryl mentioned food waste, but you know, it's the single, if we continue in terms of the practices that we have in the industry, we're going to need the resources of two planets to meet our needs. Um, and so we know that the fun part for us in our industry and in the roles that we play is, this is what we get to work on. This is, we get to balance the demands of these different customers and industries different markets and different challenges. And of course that can only happen underpinned by our science and technology portfolio, but the relationship between sustainability and innovation. So look, what that means for us at Kerry is, is that we really focus on developing a portfolio that the portfolio that we have today. And as I mentioned, looking forward to the portfolio for the future. And broadly, we really try to um, maintain that portfolio around two key areas, taste and biotechnology. And so we have people dedicated uh, in terms of both creating new technologies, new product development and new process technology to meet those needs. I want to share um, the last piece of my um, presentation is just to share a really practical example from our colleagues in the UK. And so uh, this was a recent launch that our, our team in the UK did. It's a product called Smog. It's a, it's a hybrid product. I think, um, Christine, you can, this is the portfolio that existed today. You can maybe move to the next slide, please. But this is a brand that captures the emotional feeling when you get the best of both worlds. So it's a hybrid dairy product. It has a um, win-win in terms of both taste and health and certainly hits on that no compromise or no trade-off need for consumers. So it combines the goodness of dairy and the goodness of plants. And um, it's a great tasting product and is naturally lower in fat and has a really significant um, sustainability impact. So when we think about the value proposition that Smog can bring to consumers, it was a first to market and category launch in the UK. And the intention was to create a product portfolio that dairy lovers can enjoy um, and really fits and hits the needs for sustainability and the demands of, of health and wellness for consumers. So this is a portfolio that has 40% less saturated fat and from a sustainability standpoint, saves up to 54% carbon emissions per kilogram of traditional dairy. And really this is done in a way that has no compromise from a standpoint of the rich and creamy experience and flavor that we get and that we love. And that delicious feeling is what, um, is what the brand is positioned as. So in order to back up the sustainability uh, claims that we have here, we did completed a life cycle analysis with How Good, which is a partner that we work with across our business 
and we know that converting um, the ambition here of the product into impact for our consumer choices was really important. So the commitment that Smog makes to its consumers is that you can have the same creamy and delicious dairy experience, but knowing that you're making a choice that can help reduce your carbon footprint. And so therefore it's a choice that you can feel good about your dairy consumption, one delicious creamy bite or sip at a time. So I think this has been a really practical example of how we've leveraged our technology and our capability and where we're looking to continue to meet consumers' needs and how we facilitate our customers um, meeting those needs. So Christine, I think this is our a good handover point to, over to you. I know Smog is a particularly a great example of sustainable nutrition in action. Yeah, thanks, Emer. So you're right, Smug, the Smug case study that you shared is a great example of sustainable nutrition. It's really meeting the growing consumer trend for alternative dairy solutions. And it really follows Carrie's sustainable nutrition roadmap that we use to guide and inform and support the journey we are on, which is to enhance the nutritional profile of products such as cleaner label and positive and balanced nutrition and meeting personal nutritional needs while also improving the environmental impact of the products. For example, through climate positive solutions like a hybrid solution, um, which is making products that are better for people, better for society and better for the planet and really helping our customers progress along the sustainable nutrition spectrum, which is central to Carrie's vision. Uh, it's important that these solutions are also backed by science verification and validation, as Emer said, and showed um, the impacts that are associated with the SMUG case study. Um, so it's also important that we are providing tangible guidance on the impact of sustainable sustainability across this journey. So Carrie has created interfaces to really support the answering of some of those most complex industry challenges, such as nutritional optimization or food waste, which also goes back to what Cheryl was talking about around supporting the changing regulatory climate and having those tools to help inform decision making through the innovation process to make sure that we are meeting those growing requirements and consumer needs. So as Emer discussed, innovation is really critical to meeting the shifting regulatory climate those consumer needs and to shift our food system to support the nutritional needs while impacting um, minimizing impact. So just, uh, I need to introduce myself, I know. My name is Christina O'Keefe. I'm the Director of Sustainability for Cary North America, and I manage our sustainability program from end to end. Um, I, I get the pleasure of working with Emer and Cheryl and many people across the Cary Network to really bring sustainability value through our organization and to support our customers. I think Kerry doesn't really claim to know what the future is, but we really want to be prepared, um, prepare ourselves with the knowledge and research of today by nurturing a culture of really forward thinking. Um, we can really begin to see the shape of what tomorrow might look like. Um, we see a world where we can inspire great food and nourish life in a, a world where together with you, we can really make a difference. So to do this, Carrie's Insight team completed a creative thought-provoking study using analytical and forward-looking input from 11 external subject matter experts from the field of climate, food, innovation, and agriculture, which was then third-party validated by Qatar and Board BIA. And these insights really help support how innovation plays a critical role in delivering sustainable nutrition well into the future, no matter what the future may bring. And we call this Future Lens, which explores seven plausible scenarios of the future along an axis of planetary health and consumption access. Like I said, Carrie doesn't really claim to know what the future is, but we do know it's important to consider multiple scenarios of the future pertaining to the climate crisis and what that could mean for our businesses. So Future Lens is all about pairing that innovation lens and sustainability to really future-proof decisions. And I'd love to show you just a really quick video around what this research entails. Um, so just, just forewarning, we're going to trans over to make sure that you can hear it. Uh, Emer and Cheryl, please let me know if the sound doesn't come through. Uh, one second here.
Change is happening faster and more dynamically than ever before. Our highly uncertain future means we need to be better prepared to identify opportunities in any version of the world that might arise. The time to explore these future possibilities is now, so that we are ready for change whenever it happens. At Kerry, we have developed a dynamic foresight framework to ensure we prepare for volatility and shape a more inspiring food landscape and nourishing future for society. Our journey spanned from discovering future signals of change and developing plausible future scenarios to inform future-focused action in our organization. Our exploration began with a holistic outside-in view of change, examining the shifting system within which our societies organize themselves and alongside how consumers view the world. Using a variety and breadth of leading-edge sources ensured we had an expansive view of the issues and uncertainties impacting the future. A diverse set of acclaimed experts from a range of industries were engaged with to test and stretch our hypothesis. This analysis was synthesized to build a comprehensive dynamic foresight framework formed around two key uncertainties – the future of our planetary health and the expansion or retraction of our consumption access. A series of plausible yet provocative scenarios were developed, preparing us for a range of alternative future worlds and their potential outcomes for food and beverages. This visionary dynamic foresight framework will help Kerry and our customers be at the forefront of change, ensuring we can act today, confidently making decisions for the future and navigate uncertainty. Perfect. So uh, our analysts really help develop a creative, thought-provoking group of scenarios shaped by two potential polarities. We plotted those planetary, we plotted planetary health on the x-axis, ranging from catastrophe to more manageable conditions, and contrasted this with consumer access and freedom of choice on the y-axis, highlighting four very distinct potential future directions for our, the food and beverage industry. If I can point you towards the innovate or die quadrant in the top left corner, these are potential scenarios where planetary health is catastrophic, exemplified by more really extreme weather events and patterns, yet consumers choice remains broad. We could foresee this area where radical technology and really scientific innovation becomes critical for food production and supply. The everyone for themselves quadrant, this includes the potential scenario where collaboration could be absent and consumer access restricted. We imagine we could witness maybe a, a survival of the fittest type mentality here where wealthy society organizations and individuals really pro, pro, uh, prioritize really self-preservation above all else. In the third potential quadrant at the bottom right called sustainability through doorstep living shows that the planetary systems are stable, but response to climate events and other crises remain react reactatory, reactionary. Oh man, that's a tough word today. <laughs> so we could find ourselves in a situation where disruptions in supply chains and limited access to goods and services really create a localized food system with lower innovation in our food um, and beverages. Finally, in the fourth quadrant, in the top right corner, where planetary health could become more manageable and stable and consumer freedom increases, we could see the emergence of a business as usual but better scenario. And in this era, we could imagine that food and ingredient supply chains are resilient and capable of meeting our growing and increasingly complex demands for consumers, which provides a world of indulgent experiences and really focused nutritional wants. Um, future we explore and create fictional scenarios with these four quadrants detailing seven unique and plausible situations based on data and emerging change. So within those four quadrants, we have kind of imagined different types of scenarios. So two examples is 
If we imagine the high science food ecosystem scenario, which resides at the top right quadrant of innovate or die, this would be an example of where ex we would be exceptionally excited scenario where we can see a fully modern food system emerging, which produces lower costs, superior quality food with minimal external impacts on society and the environment, all made possible through very uh, significant scientific advancements. Conversely, uh, if we imagine that if we fail to embrace this change and the fictional everyone for themselves scenario takes hold, we could enter a potential crisis state, uh, which is characterized by really high threats, self-interest, polarization, uncertainty, and inequality. Yet, the basic human needs for survival and pleasure would remain, presenting opportunities for those who can adapt and thrive with less. Now imagine if we use these plausible scenarios to look at innovation and sustainability to create solutions that would either prevent some of these scenarios or create plausible scenarios where we would like to live in. What would that look like? And this is why Carrie has taken these plausible scenarios to create a very immersive experience that includes visuals, sounds, smells, and tastes to really take you on, take the attendees through these fictional environments to create a space where cross-functional teams can discuss, challenge, and even open up creatively on how we can pair innovation and sustainability together to make future proofing decisions today and tomorrow and in the coming years. I would just like to personally invite everyone that may be interested in exploring these plausible scenarios with your teams, um, with Carrie, uh, to email me. Uh, my email there is on the screen. Uh, this experience is exclusively available at our North America Global Innovation Center, which is located in Beloit, Wisconsin. The reason why it's there is because it is immersive um, with the sounds and the taste and um, the, the visuals. Uh, Beloit, Wisconsin is located just over an hour drive outside of Chicago, so it's an easy place to get to um, if you fly into Chicago or Madison or Milwaukee. Um, so I just want to personally invite if you are interested in exploring innovation and sustainability, this is a great way to bring your cross-functional teams together if it's R&D, if it's regulatory, if it's operations, if it's your innovation team and your sustainability teams, it's great to bring everybody together to talk about how do you innovate for future regulations, for sustainability, for future scenarios. Um, and as we see the regulatory climate shift to mitigate food waste, increase reporting, and improve nutritional options, it's critical that we seek to innovate to support these requirements and really to meet those growing consumer needs, while also considering how we create a more sustainable food system to either prevent or create plausible scenarios of the future that meet those needs of future generations. So on behalf of Cheryl and Emer and myself, I would like to thank the Consumer Brands Association and the attendees for your time and attention today. And Sarah, we would love to open it up to any questions uh, the audience might have. Sounds great. Thank, thank you great. so much to the team from Kerry for those insights. And as, as Christina said, we've reached the Q&A portion of, of today's webinar. So if you have questions, Again, a quick reminder, please go ahead and put those in the Q&A uh, button. Use the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen, um, and we'll go ahead and get started. And um, whoever from the CARI team wants to answer, if you all want to take, uh, take a swing, that's great too. Um, but the first one I want to talk about, and I appreciate uh, you using that example of smug. I think it's always really awesome to have something tangible to think about as we're having these conversations around really big, important topics like innovation and sustainability. But can you talk a little bit more about what specific innovations or technologies in food production that you think are going to have that most significant impact on industries, you know, carbon footprint over the next decade? Or I'm sure um, each one of us is a little bit of a, a science nerd about all of these things when we talk about innovation and sustainability. What ones excite you the most and what do you think has the potential to have the biggest impact? Christina, it's probably good to talk about sustainable dairy. What do you think? 
Yeah, we could start there. So I think we, we gave the example of smug, which I think is a great example of where you can use a hybrid solution to reduce the carbon footprint and improve nutritional um, components of the product. I think that um, reformulation of even traditional products that we see out on the market today are going to be critical in capturing carbon reductions, right? We have to do things differently than what we've always what we've done in the past, right? Which um, doesn't mean we want to limit the taste or the experience. I think those are still heavily um, important, uh, right? As consumers are still looking for those things, but how can we create that same taste experience um, with lower carbon solutions? So the hybrid is one solution, but it could be using um, modulation or, or different innovations and technologies to still give you those same taste nodes, feels, um, while reducing sugar, fat, and salt, um, and incorporating carbon reductions. Uh, so dairy is a great example of that, using dairy innovation and technology to do that, um, either through a hybrid solution or through other um, innovative solutions that Carrie has in our portfolio. Uh, and I would say also incorporating some of those traditional sustainability um, improvements like on-farm interventions through um, Carrie Evolve program, which is Irish dairy, or the uh, regenerative agriculture into feed for dairy or manure management, or even uh, a feed additive to help with, um, with the methane production. Emer, do you have anything to add there? No, I think no. that's really helpful. I think we just need to think about why dairy stands out to me as a significant example is, is how pervasive it is in our industry, whether it's in snacks or meals or in terms of, of consumption factor. The other example that I would think about in terms of sustainability is, and it probably touches on sustainable nutrition in action as well, is the opportunity to really look at uh, continuing to take sugar out of our supply chain and I mean, in the beverage world, there's lots of examples that we have. We have a lot of enabling technology in the world of beverage that really builds back and brings the consumer experience very much back from a sensory standpoint. Um, but I think that that's another area where from a carbon footprint standpoint, there's a really significant benefit for customers and consumers as we look, you know, it's kind of a double a double win, right, on the nutrition side as well as um, on, the, um, on the sustainability side, carbon. Right. Thank you. Okay, so our next question um, talks about kind of the more the business aspect of this. So how can companies in the food and beverage sector effectively balance the need for sustainable practices with the economic realities of, you know, being profitable, especially for those small and medium sized businesses? You want me to take that? <laughs> so I think, um, you know, I recently heard the um, former head of climate for the U.S. speak, and I I thought it was a really interesting discussion that she said was we should stop actually using the word sustainability because we should just say we should be doing what's best for business. Mm -hmm. And typically when you uh, incorporate sustainability, there may be some front um, loading of costs, if that's on-farm interventions, if that's a price premium or for farmers to engage them in uh, regenerative agriculture or new practices to get them over the get them over the line, right, to become standard practice. Um, but in the long run, it's pretty. It should be um, cost neutral or even better, right? When we start thinking around operations and how do we make food um, more efficiently, those are cost savings. And I think when we talk, when I talk to customers, I like to think of things as holistically, right? So yes, there might be a cost if you want to invest in regenerative agriculture, there might be a cost if you want to invest in um, research and development, but those probably take cost off on the back end if that is shipping less water because you're concentrating ingredients, if that is um, reducing packaging because you want to move to more sustainable packaging um, uh, portfolio, if it is um, optimizing your operations to reduce waste, if that is actual waste or if that's energy waste or water waste. Um, I like to try to think of things as like, 
let's look at things holistically. And yes, there might be some inputs of cost, but there most likely are more outputs um, and reductions in cost in other parts of the supply chain. So I think we, we kind of, I think most people, to be honest, get stuck in whatever function or bubble that they're working with. And they think about the costs that are just associated with that piece of the supply chain bubble. But if you start working cross-functionally and you start talking about the improvements and the sustainability and the innovation, you're gonna start seeing where it all comes together and where it probably is a cost reduction. Anyone else from the care team? That was, it was great. I still want to say. No, I, I mean, I, I think everything that you said, Christina, was perfect. I think the other, there's a lot of analogies outside of the food and beverage industry where consumers make a lot of choices and a lot of value judgments. And I think, Cheryl, you called it out earlier, is that continuing to communicate to consumers and continuing to show them that the benefit of their choices that they can make. So I think there's, there's probably a number of categories where you could see, yeah, that there's a a, a point of difference in terms of on on shelf price, but I think that the transparency in terms of information gives consumers the ability to be able to think about, okay, I'm I'm making a, a choice here, but I can understand that the the benefit of that choice. Um, and I guess look, there's been a lot of a lot of economic discussion. We know that there's the realities of life, um, but I think that that consumer transparency and education is a really important part of that equation going forward. Uh, I was just kind of thinking, Emer, of an example of where, you know, it might benefit an upfront cost to um, support reductions in the back end, right? And I, I think of bread, um, a loaf of bread, right? And if you can extend the shelf life, maybe by investing in innovation around, um, uh, you know, clean label preservation, that you can extend the shelf life up to 14 days of a loaf of bread. And what does that mean, right? Well, one, for a consumer, it means that they can buy a loaf of bread and probably not waste as much, right? If you don't get through the entire loaf um, before the end of its shelf life. For a, uh, a bakery or um, private label, like it's that you can, um, you know, consolidate maybe your bakeries so that you can ship the, 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 um, bread to a larger market because you have an extended shelf life so you can hit a larger market which maybe helps you with the operation side of things but it also on the other side could expand your market right and grow your organization so I think these are the kind of discussions that we have with our customers on like what is your goal what are you trying to achieve and how can we do that sustainably um, if that's either to grow your market, if that's to reduce food waste, if that's to lower your carbon, I think the important thing is to know what is your ultimate goal and then how can we look at that holistically? Thanks, great. And uh, Chris, uh, Sarah, I'll just add also, and it's part of the regulations that that are being, you know, or national strategies that are being incentivized or encouraged, and that's the reduction of waste um, and organic recycling of organic materials. So that's when you can look at your operation and see if there are things that would normally be thrown out that could be made to something else, right? So we're seeing a lot of that now in the industry, um, just like non-food materials are being upcycled or terms like that, where you find other uses for things. You know, you could utilize bones to make a broth versus getting rid of mm -hmm. them, et cetera. So um, that has a huge opportunity and impact as well. Yeah, one of my favorite topics, Cheryl, upcycling, right? Making sure that there is no byproducts within the food system that can't be utilized for human or pet consumption, right? Bringing it up on the um, the the food pyramid, right? A uh, waste pyramid. So I'm um, huge advocate of uh, upcycling ingredients and finding solutions to valorize those uh, materials. Mm -hmm. One once again, Sarah, when we say we talk about cost, like if you can valorize your by, your byproducts and your waste streams, it helps your bottom line and provides you another revenue point um, and supports the reduction in food waste, carbon reduction, processing reductions, right? So um, upcycling by far in the theory around circular systems is a huge way to one, reduce uh, impact, but also provide financial benefits.
and then beyond the environmental, just feeding more people mm -hmm. and, and the hunger as well. There is, um, you know, there is enough food wasted to feed mm -hmm. everybody who goes hungry in the world. So if we, I always say, if we can solve food waste, we've solved world hunger, uh, theoretically. One, we have one more question, and Cheryl, I'm going to ask you to um, to start this one off. Um, it's a little bit more on the the global regulatory landscape side that um, that you talked about at the beginning of today's webinar. So, with all those evolving that that landscape, that evolving global landscape. Um, and the need, as we've discussed really holistically today, to think about innovation. I think sometimes there's a there's a concern that uh, that regulatory landscape can actually hinder innovation instead of pushing it forward. So how do you think about um, or, or give advice around how we make sure that even as companies are navigating that, um, that, that they're prepared for those shifts so that innovation can continue instead of kind of come to a halt? I would say that's why we belong to amazing trade associations like the Consumer Brands Association, who we can work together with plug, other. But thank you. <laughs> that was unplugged. That was, but it was really where industry comes together, industry thought leaders, et cetera, and, you know, really share uh, concerns and solutions. And then we can work, uh, you know, with both federal and state um, authorities to kind of make sure they see this point in when we're talking about ingredients that might be innovative and the importance of being flexible in that. Yeah, that's a great it's, it Coming together, like making sure those conversations, which you're doing a lot of work with, and it, they're just so important, right? Yeah. Um, Mar says, you know, you want to make sure that there's always the, the, the weird connection of science and politics, right? So we need to make sure we're leading with science always and um, making sure that we're communicating and educating yeah. decision makers. I don't think it's weird. I've made a whole career out of it. I don't think that's yeah. weird. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't see any more questions. So I just want to say once again, thank you to to all the Carrie team, to Cheryl and Emer and Christina for joining us today. And, and thank you to Carrie for your continued support of the Consumer Brands Association. And for everyone that joined today, thank you for joining our session. For more information on consumer brands upcoming events and webinars, you can visit our events and education page. So thank you. Hope everyone has a great day and we'll see you again soon. Thanks, Carrie team Thanks. and everyone. Bye. Bye.